Well, welcome, friends. It's Tuesday morning. Uh, my name's Simon Gillum. I'm the vice principal here at Moore College, and it's my great privilege to be your host for this morning's edition, the third instalment of the annual Moore College Lectures. The Moore College Lectures were first held in 1977, and we've been taught in this forum uh, by such great international speakers as J.I. Packer, uh, Don Carson, F.F. F. Bruce, Mike Ovey, Ashley Null, Gerald Bray, Kevin Van Hooser, and Carl Truman, amongst many others. And we've been blessed during this time, too, to hear from many of our past and present Moore College faculty. And this year, we are delighted uh, to welcome back our own, Dr David Honey, as he continues this year's series, In Him All Things Hold Together, The Triune God and the choosing self. David is a Christian brother, a valued colleague, and a dear friend. David joined the faculty here in 2007 after years of pastoral ministry in both the Canberra Goulburn and Sydney dioceses, and he's been our academic here, our academic dean here, since 2018. In addition this year to strongly advocating for the regular practice of deep breathing and Zoom stretching, uh, in the first two lectures, David has been leading us to explore the significance of appreciating the triune God in order to understand ourselves and our place in his world. In a society awash with ideas that we might be the sum of our choices, defined and empowered by our choices, David has been helping us to consider again, the significance of recognising God's choice of Jesus. We cannot understand God, the world, ourselves, or our place in his world, apart from understanding God's choice of Jesus, the centrality and exaltation of Jesus to the glory of God. Today, David's going to be taking us into considering the reality of our lived experience in this light. Hopefully, if you've managed to find your way uh, to the live stream, as you have, uh, you've also managed to find the outline that's on the uh, website there. I encourage you to download that uh, by clicking on the link. And you'll also find there uh, a link to the Slido app where you can ask your questions. Uh, you can either use the Slido app or just click the link on the website. If you're using the app, the code for today is 637-265. Uh, and if we have time at the end, we'll be delighted uh, to address some of those questions. Uh, you might like to note too that all of the lectures are being recorded live. And if you want to access the recordings later on, you can do so uh, on this website uh, later at um, later today, later in the week. The lecture recordings will be made available in a more long-term way on the Moore College website in a couple of weeks free of charge as well. Well, before David comes to speak to us, I want to read from God's Word and then pray for him. And uh, I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, I'll respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants 
and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders, looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Let's pray as David comes up. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this new day. We thank you for life, for breath, for health and safety. We thank you above all else for your Son, the Lord Jesus, whom you sent to a world in rebellion against him. And Father, we thank you for your word that you've not left us clutching about without a clue, but you've spoken to us. And so we pray, Father, as we consider you and your world and our place, that you might continue to speak to us through your living, active word. And we pray this morning, Father, that you'd bless your servant David and bless all that he says to us for your glory and our good. Amen. Please welcome David. Well, good morning again, everyone. Great to be with you again today. Yesterday, I pursued a portrait of a share in the reality of God and the world that comes to us at the same time in Jesus Christ the Lord, since he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn born over all creation, in whom and through whom we receive our share of the reality of God. My intention was to broaden and deepen the portrait of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who confronts the choosing self. From this portrait, the choosing self discovers itself in a world that the Father has created through and for the exaltation of his Son as the Lord. Furthermore, on the advice of Athanasius, This world is the choice of the Father to express his pleasure for the Son, the world which his divine form of grace is initiative for the Son as Jesus the Christ. At the same time, I argue that the Son's response, his pleasure in the Father, the love from which he glorifies the Father, is his form of divine grace. Finally, I've suggested that both Arius and Hegel as the representative of the choosing self's theology, have begun with a false premise. They began with a world inherently somehow against, alien, or otherwise averse to the life of God. Instead, I have posited that the world is that kind of being, that kind of existence, that the Father created from nothing for the purpose of exalting the Christ, Jesus, as Lord. This is the world in which the Lord Jesus confronts the choosing self. I want to take up uh, this morning a different angle on the reality of the world that we begin to we began to explore yesterday in relation to the Father's will for himself and his creation, especially the theological context that provides for the confrontation between the choosing self and God's choice of Jesus Christ as the image and firstborn over creation. I appealed to the eschatological picture of the exalted Messiah in Psalm 110, reigning from the right hand of God as Lord, leading the creation in worship of the Father to his glory. Yet this is a portrait of the new creation, one where sin, death and evil has been thoroughly subdued, if not destroyed. The reality of our perception, our experience, is very different. We live every day with a constant clash of wills between each other and, most importantly, towards God the Father. Thus far, I have used mainly philosophical and sociological tools to describe the manner in which the choosing self seeks self-determination through self-actualization. 
the desire for change so easily confused with progress, a view of truth that enables the genius to intuit beauty in the real world, the power of the artist to create her own image in the world, her Bildung, an assumption that the living force of things is being revealed in that image. All these were symptoms and signs of the romantic aspect of the choosing self. When this kind of self-image was fed into the system that is free market capitalism, a vast economy of consumption and commodification of the self ensues. Empowered by perpetually growing markets designed to free her from constraint from others, the choosing self undertakes its greatest project, self-glorification through self-exploitation. We buy identities while swapping and trading images of our self, our ideal self, to be consumed and worshipped by others. The true genius in this era is the greatest influencer. With such a compulsion towards self-profession, the choosing self very quickly turns completely inward and often tragically so. Stories abound in the old media of influencers running up extraordinary bills for plastic surgery in the quest for the perfect jawline to elicit the greatest number of Instagram likes. Yet as the gap between the ideal self and the actual widens beyond our reach, the self we would choose becomes an unbearable burden to the point that the choosing self can become completely alienated from the physicality that God gave it. The results are the various kinds of dysmorphia that used to exist in the shadows but have now become commodified for trade in the struggle for the means of production of the modern self. Nearly a century ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, while analysing the various philosophical strains of the modern self, concluded that the modern self is cor curvum in se, a heart turned in on itself. It's a phrase that he borrowed from Luther to describe the way the choosing self cannot get outside of itself to engage with the reality of the world that God has chosen for Jesus the Christ to be Lord. The I understands itself from itself in a closed system. You will recall that there was a third cluster of symptoms that makes up the choosing self syndrome I described last Thursday night. The third one was suspicion. The choosing self is at times and infrequently so suspicious in the sense that like Nietzsche, the choosing self is pressed towards being suspicious of any humanitarian morality, especially its source. The mental health issues of individuals that result in them choosing various forms of self-destruction for the sake of an ideal image, otherwise unattainable, are a tragedy. Yet Nietzsche's contribution to the culture of suspicion turns their tragedy into a badge of honour. The Enlightenment was supposed to be throwing off the dead hand of Christendom in the name of self-determination. The individual should assume the responsibility of her will to power, says Nietzsche. Thus, in works like The Genealogy of Morality, Nietzsche attacked the slave morality of the Christian tradition, the ethic of self-sacrificial service after the great example of the crucified Christ. This slave morality worked against the will to power, creating weakness in Nietzsche's mind. Further, the slave morality that would have the choosing self abandon its will to power is the product of resentiment or resentment, envy. The beginning of the slave's revolt in morality, I'm quoting Nietzsche here, the beginning of the slave's revolt in morality occurs when resentiment itself turns creative and gives birth to values. The resentiment of those beings who denied the proper response of action compensate for it with imaginary revenge. Whereas all noble morality grows out of a triumphant saying yes to itself, slave morality says no on the principle that to everything that is outside, other, non-self, and thus this no is its creative deed. That's Nietzsche from the genealogy of morality. What he's saying here is an obsession with the other is a feature of the slave's resentment. They need some kind of opposing external world in order to act at all. 
but they're merely reactive. The noble or master morality seeks out its opposite so that it can say yes to itself even more thankfully and exultantly. Thus, the master morality is spontaneous, saturated with life and passion. The ability to be concerned with yourself alone is the power, while the desire to engage with others causes suffering in others. It's cruelty. Nietzsche's remarks about the freedom that choosing self should be given to pursue its will to power, and especially the cruelty of those who might encourage it to do otherwise, namely Christians in their slave morality, seem rather chilling in our current environment. Yet it is the reason I suspect that even questioning the possibility of a gap between the reality of an individual's perception and their perception of reality is treated as hatred. When it comes to the culture of suspicion that Nietzsche and his lesser readers have inspired, the rules of critique demand that anyone can play the unmasking game. That is, at least in terms of finding an answer to the question, what happens when the, choosing of, when the choice of God for Jesus as the Christ and Lord confronts the choosing self? What I'm saying here is that this morning I will attempt to read against the grain of the choosing self's will to power. At one level, I don't expect to change Nietzsche's mind. In fact, he is correct. Christianity is grounded in the self-sacrificial life and death of Jesus the Christ but not merely as an example, as according to the romantics like Schleiermacher. The rereading of history that we shall pursue this morning is far more than a tale of God forgetfulness. Rather, it's a story of an alienated and hostile mind expressed in evil actions. It's a story of cruelty and revenge, of resentment and envy, an envy that is hell-bent towards the destruction of the one true source of life for the world. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, you'll recall the Colossians is our key passage throughout this week. In chapter 1, verse 21, Paul writes, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds in works of evil. Since all things hold together in Jesus, the Messiah of God, I shall reread Paul's words and those into the gospel accounts where they are embodied in the biographies of the beloved Son. But first, deep breath. Today's Zoom stretch. Brought to you by Envy. Let's pursue. Each of the synoptic accounts of Jesus the Christ contained perhaps the only parable told by the Lord that was readily understandable to his audience. The parable of the wicked tenants that Simon read for us. That is, in this case, the hearers, the Pharisees and the temple rulers, heard this parable and understood that he was not just speaking about them, but to them. In this precinct of the recently reclaimed temple, the publicly acknowledged son of David at once denounces the history of the religious establishment against the word of God and simultaneously foretells his own death at their hands. The vineyard is the land, the tenants are the temple rulers with various messengers representing the prophets of old and Israel's reaction to them. The climax of the story is, of course, the reaction of the tenants to the landowner's choice to send his son. I'll read Matthew's version from chapter 21. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. The tenants are not jealous of the son's claim to the vineyard, since their possession of the land is by covenant, not by natural right. The tenants are certainly covetous of the son's inheritance, though, and therefore resentful. Yet there is more. The tenants are truly envious. They seek his destruction rather than having to admit their true status. If we can't have the vineyard, then he certainly won't. So they destroy him. It's the first part of our exploration this morning. We're going to pursue the story of envying the beloved son. 
This is arguably arguably the point of no return for the son of David, but it's exactly the reason that he has come to the city of David. If there's any doubt about the parable of the wicked tenants and the response of the temple establishment, at the trial of Jesus, the Messiah in the gospel accounts makes it explicit. Both Matthew and Mark record Pilate offering the people a choice of Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas, the failed insurrectionist, because he knew they were envious of the claims that Jesus was making. Now, Basil of Caesarea, one of the Cappadocian fathers responsible for Nicene theology in the form of the 381 Constantinople Creed, Basil famously wrote on the topic of envy, and we shall keep him close as a conversation partner this morning. Basil understood the source of Jewish envy as a product of Jesus' miraculous signs. I quote from Basil, Why did they envy him? Because of his miracles. What were these miraculous works? The salvation of the needy. The bishop is arguing for the irrationality of the passion called envy. I quote again, Envy teaches us to fight against God. It is the mother of homicide, giving birth to violation of nature, ignorance of kinship and disasters of the most irrational sort. The envious person ends up despising the good they receive at the hands of a benefactor. Basil's recognition of the importance of envy in the gospel stories is a useful affirmation, but I think we can do better insofar as there's more to the clash of wills that is the envy between Jesus and the temple rulers. The envy is over the claim of custodial care for the conditions of right worship in Israel. Yesterday, I drew attention to the use of the tabernacle and temple as analogies used by the the gospel writers to explain the personal presence of the Lord in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Key to that description was Jesus' own interpretation of his relationship to the temple in the gospel accounts. However, the relationship between Jesus and the temple in the gospel accounts serves another purpose as well. In John's account, the temple cleansing, the temple's, sorry, In John's account of the temple cleansing, his disciples interpret his actions in terms of Psalm 69, in which the Messiah prophesies that zeal for your house will consume me. When placed in the context of the temple cleansing by John, the prophecy becomes programmatic of the ministry of Jesus, especially his conflict with the Jews. While only the Johannine accounts of the temple cleansing uh, references the psalm, All the Gospels have the newly acclaimed son of David confronting the temple establishment over the worship owed to the God of Israel. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers, he says. Jesus, the son of David, is indeed filled with zeal for his father's house. He bears the name of the one who will cleanse and reestablish the temple after the exile, according to Zechariah 3. Therefore, as Dumbrell suggests, his entry into and actions in the temple ought to be viewed in this light. The conflict in the temple between Jesus and the Jews is less one of the business being carried out in the temple courts than the fact that Israel has come to treat the house which is called by my name as an idol that will save them from their antagonism towards the Messiah. Hence, the spiritually empowered son of David takes custody of the temple made with hands in anticipation of purifying the worship of Israel again. In fact, long before the exile, the story of the Messiah as the custodian of the house of the Lord has an evolving nature. Again, Dumbrell points to the book of 1 Samuel, which begins with pagan idolatry next to the ark at Shiloh, and 2 Samuel concludes with David purchasing land for the site of the temple. In between, the narrative describes a great many reforms to the Israelite cult, Elimination of abuses, the purification of worship, the provision of a centralised shrine. Most importantly, David leads the worship as the ark is brought into the city of Zion in 1 Samuel 6, and Solomon, his son, leads Israel in commissioning the temple in 1 Kings 8. If If we allow the scriptures to speak to each other, we can note that Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, Josiah in 2 Kings 22, and Ezekiel in chapters 40 to 48, are all instances when particularly royal action in the temple was associated with restoring the kingdom 
and preparing the temple for worship. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem and proceeds to the temple, his mission is to take custody of the right worship in Israel. So the conflict between Jesus and the Jews that takes place under a darker shadow, in John 8, Jesus denounces them as the sons of Satan, the liar and murderer. The cosmic scope of the conspiracy against God's chosen one stems from the wilderness temptation that follows immediately on Jesus' baptism, where the Father explicitly addresses Jesus in the Spirit as beloved and towards whom expresses the delight of that choice. As we saw yesterday morning, the language of address from father to son enfolds the identity of Jesus in messianic promises endowed in the Spirit. Significantly, Luke's account includes a genealogy that links Jesus to Adam, the original narrative image bearer. (coughs) In the wilderness, the beloved son meets the Satan, whom Jesus will later confront in different guises. Basil considered the Satan as a fountain of envy in the greater narrative. He writes, He was angry with God because of his generosity towards humanity, but it was upon humanity that he took his vengeance since he could not take hold of God. Though many writers throughout the tradition will entertain such speculation for the rationale of the evil one, the Jewish tradition of Wisdom 2.24 being a prime candidate, the wilderness temptation gives us some substance for these motives. In the desert, the devil lies to the beloved son, claiming that all the kingdoms of the world are his for the offering, if only the son will bow in worship. Of course, we know that as the firstborn, the Messiah can expect to sit and reign if he trusts in the promises of the father. Psalm 2 verse 8 says, from the father to the son, ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the end of the earth your possession. From the perspective of the gospel accounts, at least, we can agree with Basil that the strong man, as Jesus will portray him, is the key source of hostile intentions against the one who is the father's choice, both in his person and by the spirit with his deeds. So when we take the observations of Paul regarding the nature of sin towards the image bearer and firstborn to the gospel accounts, we have a strong case for understanding envy towards God's choice of Jesus as a driving force in the gospel narratives. The temple rulers, as minions of the evil one, envy the claim of the beloved son over the presence of God in the world and his right to exercise authority in the power of the spirit. The Messiah is the custodian of God's presence in the world and in the power of God's spirit, the sole agent through whom one might receive a share in the reality of God, since all things hold together in him. Through the parable of the wicked tenants and now in the conflict between Satan and the beloved son, we've had glimpses of a longer story of this hostility towards God's chosen one. Of course, to gain a a sense of the fundamental contribution this conflict makes to our understanding of sin in general, we need to reconsider the conflict between the image bearer and the serpent. To get back to that point, however, we shall take a slightly longer route through the Old Testament story stopping off in significant points in which envy of God's chosen one forms the basis of conflict over God's promises. So, deep breath, (coughs) zoom stretch, casting an eye on those around you, no doubt. Envy of God's chosen saviour. As with many other features in his gospel portrait, the life of David sets a precedent for Jesus of Nazareth, and envy of his divine election is no exception. Chapter 18 of 1 Samuel gathers together for the reader a chronicle of the clash of wills between Saul and David over the kingship of David, with Saul's envy of David playing a significant role in the unfolding saga. When David returns from routing the Philistines, the people rejoice, and the women sing the praises of their king and his champion. But the narrator reveals a different response from Saul. The prospect of David gaining greater appeal amidst the throng might otherwise be thought of to belong to the king, pits the former against the latter. Saul was incensed, and this thing was evil in his eyes. The next he'll have is the kingdom. We overhear Saul muttering to himself. The perceived slight on the part of the king could perhaps be interpreted as jealousy, 
Yet, as Saul keeps a suspicious eye on David from that day hence, Basil observes, he made the extraordinary kindness shown to him a cause for war against David. Saul the king is envious of God's choice of David, and the evidence unfolds in two ways from prior to this event until some time after it. Prior to 1 Samuel 18, the reader has been made party to the secret anointing of David by Samuel because the Lord rejected Saul as king over Israel, we read in 1 Samuel 16. With Samuel's chrism, the spirit of the Lord gripped David from that day onward. The young man now displaces Saul since David is the one Yahweh sees with the heart. What is more, even the revelation of David as Messiah is a family secret. Through Samuel, Saul has been publicly denounced by Yahweh. The Lord has torn away the kingship of Israel from you this day and given it to your fellow man. Therefore, Saul's later response to the success of David must be viewed as more than jealousy, for Saul no longer has claim before the Lord for the praise being offered to his champion, and Saul knows it. The kingdom already belongs to David. Back in 1 Samuel 18, on the very next day that Saul suspiciously watches David, we read that he is now possessed of an evil spirit from God as opposed to the Holy Spirit that rests on David. In keeping with this, Saul's reactions quickly descend from love to violent hostility, fearful awe, then murderous intent. Not only would Saul take away the people's recognition of his general, he seeks his life, first secretly, then openly. Saul envies God's choice of David as the saviour of Israel and her true king and assumes the revolve in the remaining narrative of the Messiah's enemy. In the end, Nietzsche's concept is reversed. The inward man of Saul is filled with fear, while the outward servant of the Lord, David, lives with joy. Deep into the journey of the Israel, sorry, deep into the journey of Israel through the wilderness, Miriam, Miriam and Aaron dispute Moses' exclusive role as the prophet of Yahweh for Israel. Alter calls it a classic case of sibling rivalry something we shall consider further today. In the meantime, in this short chapter, we have covetousness, if not outright envy, appearing on the lips of Miriam. Is it but Moses alone that the Lord has spoken? He has not spoken through us as well? Although Miriam is referring, referred to as a prophetess in Exodus 15, 20, having led the women in song, we have no real insight into the truth of her claim. Nevertheless, hard up against Moses' stated humility, his sister and brother make an equal and potentially rival claim for power and authority in the community, with the only mitigating circumstance being that they don't seek his destruction. Nevertheless, the Lord confronts them suddenly, perhaps with the actual experience of a prophet, and the elder siblings are summoned to meet with Yahweh as Moses does. The Lord came down in the pillar of a cloud and stood at the entrance, we're told. Throughout the audience, Yahweh informs Miriam and Aaron how much greater Moses' experience is than their imagined oracle. If your prophet be the Lord's in a vision to him, would I be known in a dream? Would I speak through him? Not so my servant Moses, mouth to mouth do I speak with him and vision. And not in riddles and the likeness of the Lord he beholds. Confrontation with the Lord reveals the complete superficiality of the sibling envy. They do not even understand that which they want from Moses. Instead, the Lord's punishment becomes an opportunity for the divine prerogative to be restored as Moses is called upon by Aaron to intercede for his sister. What is more, the real power of divine choice is manifest in the succinctness of Moses' plea. God, please heal her. To which the Lord responds, in keeping with everything else, he said to his chosen servant, Moses. At a basic level, this incident does little to move the narrative forward, save to emphasise the gap between the choice of God and the intentions of sinner. Moses enjoys otherwise unheard of intimacy with the Lord and this, and this for the sake of Israel, a matter highlighted after the incident with the golden calf. So another instance of envy showing perhaps the triviality, the superficiality uh, of the choosing self's reaction 
to the choice of God. Now, we're going to take a break now. Uh, in five minutes, I'd like you to come back. But uh, in the meantime, stand up, move away from the screen, shake your jiggles out, uh, and we'll come back and pursue the story of envy into the age of the patriarchs and beyond. We arrive back in the age of the patriarchs during an incident in which the issues of divine choice and human response are at once simple and vexing. Few instances capture this as well as the life of Joseph, son of Jacob. The chief thing to note here is the way that the integrity of divine choice emerges through trial and by inverse proportion to human intent. As Jacob's choice, Joseph begins in favoritism, a factor that is only aggravated by the possibility of divine endorsement. Joseph, rather infamously, is the recipient of paternal favour in the form of that coat, a preference not lost on his siblings and, perhaps understandable, the seeds of envy are sown. The youth, however, lacks the insight not to confirm their prejudice. He, is brought, he brings a bad report about them to their father in Genesis 37, verse 2. At that time, as Sana points out, dreams were recognised as divine communication. Yet despite this strong intimation of God's endorsement, the dream was recognised to be inseparable from the personality. A telling point, considering God is hardly mentioned in the whole account, and the dreams of Joseph are in stark contrast to the con uh, confrontation between God and his father. Jealous siblings and bewildered parents both alike confuse the prophecy with the lad's self-esteem and not without good reason. The possibility that the dreams may one day come true turns jealousy into murderous envy as the older brothers conspire to kill their rival. From Genesis 37, 9 and 10, they said to one another, Oh, look, here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him, then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But for the intervention of the eldest, the younger would have been doomed, and so instead, at Judah's urging, they choose the lesser of two evils, and Joseph is sold into slavery, and his story of demise is concocted for the patriarch. While the language of choosing not to shed blood to avoid blood guilt could be linked to the divine command of Genesis 9 as the reason for their decision, Divine determination in favour of Joseph is otherwise quite invisible here and remains relatively elusive throughout the bulk of the narrative, again, compared to the experience of his father. Basil again drew attention to this, the irrationality that envy brings in this situation. I quote, Because they feared that Joseph's dreams would be fulfilled, they made him a slave. <clears throat> no one would ever have to pay homage to him again. And yet if the dreams are true, is there any scheme at all that can prevent the events they foretell from being fulfilled? But if the visions seen in dreams are false, why be jealous of someone who is self-deceived? It's only in the final stages of this whole story that the sovereign nature of divine choice is articulated by its chief recipient, that is Joseph, the now viceroy over all Egypt. Twice in keeping with the dreams, the once envious brothers prostrate themselves before Joseph as his slaves. On the first occasion, Joseph finally reveals his identity to his dismayed brothers. With only a barest reference to their actions, Joseph assures them, For sustenance God has sent me before you. God has sent me before you to make you a remnant on earth and to preserve life, for you to be great, a great surviving group. And so it is not you who sent me here, but God. That's Robert Alter's translation of Genesis 45. Some commentators suggest that the very general reference to the divine on Joseph's lips indicates that he views the situation more philosophically or even faithfully. It is preferable, however, to understand the narrator's previous commentary of divine activity behind Joseph's success as now spoken through the mouth of the protagonist in keeping with his interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph has the position that he does because God gave him insight. He now reveals a key feature of our theological reflection on the place of envy in sin. The sovereign nature of God's choice is revealed in the way that the evil that resists him is made to serve as an instrument of his goodwill towards the world. 
God works to preserve life over and against sin, death and evil. The envy of the brothers towards God's choice is deconstructed as an instrument of divine intention. Egypt has been saved for the sake of Jacob and his kin, and God's choice of Joseph is fundamental to that activity. The second time Joseph expounds the sovereignty of the divine will over and against the envy of the brothers comes after their father's death. Their former guilt still remains on their consciences, and at their father's charge they plead for forgiveness, again prostrating themselves and offering themselves as slave. Yet Joseph's response is likewise the same. Fear, fear not, for am I instead of God? While you meant evil towards me, God meant it for good, so as to bring about this very time keeping many people alive. Sorry, so as to bring about at this very time keeping many people alive, and so fear not. That's from Genesis 50. Once again, the insight with which God has blessed Joseph throughout the narrative enables him to understand and interpret a kind of compatibilism that exists between divine choice and human envy. Such is the immensity of divine sovereignty that the alienated minds of hostile individuals are nevertheless reduced to instruments in service of divine intention to save. Grace and mercy characterise the acts of God as the brothers both receive what they did not deserve and were spared that which they did deserve. <coughs> Now, we've made our way back through the story that leads to the death of Christ almost to the very beginning. Along the way, we've observed an account of alienation and hostile intent towards God's chosen one, the firstborn. The root cause of human sin is envy towards God's designated servant or son. This definition is not exactly in keeping with the small t tradition, and so it's only right that we engage with this more specifically and from the perspective of where the fundamentals of the traditional doctrine of sin are grounded, the creation story or the prehistory section of Genesis, where we are first introduced to God's will for his image. The saga of alienation from the hostile intents towards the divine image bearer and firstborn begins in the garden with those created in his likeness. At the serpent's goading, the seed of envy is planted in the woman's heart in the shrewdest of ways by insinuating envy in God himself. God knows that when you eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, says the Satan, or the serpent in this form. Athanasius has described God as good, grudging nothing, grudging nothing its existence. However, Beings are given a share in the power of his own word, so that having as it were shadows of the word and being made rational, living the true life, they are made with a free choice, so God gives them a law for them to live by and guard the grace given them. <clears throat> in response, the woman and the man take for themselves that which they feel that God is depriving them. Even though they are already made in the likeness of God's image, they want more than to be the mediums of divine reign in the world. They do not want God to exercise his will over them or even through them. Athanasius appeals to Wisdom 2.23 and cites, By envy of the devil, death has come into the world. He seems to have a similar view to Basil regarding envy of the evil one towards humanity. The human response to the devil's envy is to turn away from contemplation of God to the self and thus to fleshly desires, says Athanasius. <clears throat> but when by the counsel of the serpent he departed from the consideration of God and began regarding himself, they fell not only to bodily lust, but knew that they were naked and knowing that were ashamed. We note that Athanasius is largely exegeting Romans 1 here, with a nod to the Genesis events. The woman departed from the contemplation of things of thought, seeing pleasure is good for her, she was misled and abused the name of the good. Now the ascetic nature of Athanasius' theology is evident, but not to the conclusion of the basic goodness of creation. But what is good is, while evil is not. This is Athanasius, I'm quoting again, sorry. But what is good is, while evil is not. But what is, then, I mean what is good inasmuch as it is, has a pattern in God who is. 
But by what is not, I mean what is evil, insofar as it consists in false imagination in the thoughts of men. That's from Contra Gentiles, or against the Gentiles. As Augustine will later describe things, though the woman has exchanged truth for a lie, she has misplaced her loves, having, in fall, having fallen in love with pleasure, says Athanasius. Nevertheless, the bodily turn brought a fear of death, which will later be named as the devil's power. God consequently judges their rebellion and determines that they are to leave the special space of fellowship for the open world where they must nevertheless undertake the mandate with the added curse of pain. Pain in childbirth, pain in working, the ground for a living. Ultimately, they will lose the opportunity to participate in the propagation of life and lose any likeness that might relate them to God or even other living things. In fact, they must forfeit the gift of life itself. The ones made in the likeness of God's image will be permitted to participate in the plan of God, but will do so burdened by their envy of divine sovereignty. The fall has left them like God in this way. They have power to make decisions by which, of course, by which they course their own lives and their world will be controlled. However, they do not have the ability to be sure their decisions are right in themselves, nor the assurance that such decisions will promote the right consequences. In contrast to humanity's cursed state, and apart from the elements we've noted in the section above, there is a first hint of God's will for his son grafted into the fallen creation. It comes in the form of the curse for the serpent. Enmity will I set between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. Her boot, he will boot your head and you will bite his heel. That's uh, Alter's translation of Genesis 3. I went for the head booting. This proto-gospel, uh, as Luther called it, plants a kernel of expectation moving the narrative forward or directing it forward now that one born of a woman will triumph over the ultimate agent of envy. This son of Eve, whom we shall come to know as the father's spiritually empowered kinsman redeemer, is the first instance of God's mysterious choices in the perfection of his plan for the earth. We have already met him in the company of the Satan, but from an eschatological perspective with which we have treated the biblical narrative, it's easy to read this reference looking forward. At the same time, the woman with child, sorry, at the same time, the woman with child character will be central to the idea of hope in the longer narrative until the point when the spirit sanctifies a woman alone as the God bearer. Certainly, we could be at odds with Athanasius here since he wanted to stress the incarnation of a, as an act of grace, and it is. The proto-gospel could add a degree of necessity to this, but we need only look to the manner of his coming in Philippians 2 as the means of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He comes because of his pleasure for the Father, we learnt yesterday. As expected, the man and woman continue on God's plan and produce children, Cain and Abel. Sometime later, the two sons bring an offering of their labours to the Lord, and the Lord famously has regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Here we have an instance of envying God's favour. The Lord response to Cain makes him furious and despondent, the event gives us some important insight into the mysterious nature of his will. It's possible that Abel's offering is preferred because, as the narrator stipulates, that Abel brings the very best of his flock to God. From this, we might infer, therefore, that Abel was more grateful than Cain. From the patristic perspective, Irenaeus has this to offer. These acts, as Cain did, who, when he was counseled by God to keep quiet, because he had not made an equitable division of that share to which his brother was entitled, but with envy and malice thought he could domineer over him. Not only did he acquiesce, but he even added to sin to sin, indicating his state of mind by his action. Cain is certainly hostile in mind towards the one who has, cho has chosen with divine favour, and the former clearly evidences this in his evil actions towards the latter. Basil refers to Cain as the devil's first disciple. Cain fights against God even as he destroys his brother instead of being glad for him. 
Now, it could be argued that there's a degree of antagonism in the divine choice itself. After all, the incident introduces what we uh, become, what will become an aspect of mystery in divine choice, that the younger son is preferred to the older throughout the long Bible story. This action on the Lord's part is certainly counterintuitive from an ancient Near Eastern cultural point of view, but it is what follows that should alert us to the simplistic decisions about the nature of God's mysterious will. The Lord is close enough to Cain for there to be dialogue between them, and yet Cain seems unmoved by Yahweh's questioning. Cain's only explicit response to this situation is to take out his frustrations on his younger brother through murder. The Lord confronts Cain in hiding like his parents before him, but even here he is not abandoned by God because of this. He is, of course, driven away from the land, but what follows adds further mystery to Yahweh's dealings with humanity and what the tradition has come to describe as God's providential dealing with humanity. Another thing to note in this incident is the practice of making offerings to the Lord itself. There's been nothing from the Lord on this matter. The practice itself is completely rational, given both what will emerge with the cult of Israel or the judgment against humanity in Romans, to which Athanasius drew our attention. Apart from this, there's no other origin story for what will become a long-running practice in relation to the image, the practice of making and worshipping idols. <clears throat> All right, deep breath, envy stretch. We've envied God's favour. Now we have the prospect of envying God's proximity. Chapter 6 offers one possibility for the origin of idolatry. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, with the possibility of further insight into the effects of envy in the heavenlies. The account is elliptical to be sure, but indicates that an essential division between heaven and earth has been compromised, as heavenly creatures take earthly creatures for their own, creating some kind of hybrid. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were comely and they took themselves wives however they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth, the sons of God have come to be with the daughters of men who bore them children. That's Genesis chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> as impressive as these creatures are amidst humanity, the divine judgment is that creation has reached a new low point. As God saw the earth and looked, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth. The will of God for creation appears to be doomed as the Lord not only regrets having created humanity but also determines to destroy all the living. Now the possibility that an ordinary and necessary divide between heaven and earth has been breached may at least be seen as a definitive origin for the role of powers and principalities that Paul will speak about in Colossians chapter 2 or the archon to play a role in antagonising the will of God the Father in the world. That the sons of God have their own image in the world, in collusion with the ones originally intended to be like the image bearer, could be the path towards idolatry that's otherwise missing in the longer story. Then we have the prospect of envying God's position. The will of God for his chosen one has progressed, resisted and yet unabated as humanity after the flood has now spread over the earth. Significantly, they still enjoy a considerable element of blessing language, one of the main markers of being in the likeness of God's image. However, this source of unity is employed for evil rather than for good. Travelling together to the east, perhaps to reclaim the lost Eden, and like their ancestor Cain, they build a city. It's the point of the city, though, that reveals the people's envy. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, Come, let us build us a city, a tower with its top in the heavens, that we may make us a name, lest we be scattered in the earth. Um, using following Alter's translation there. While it is commonly assumed that humanity is trying to storm heaven from their newly constructed fortress, a more nuanced reading of the historical cultural setting would see that the city has a tower fit for the presence of a deity. Yet the people claim this heavenly position 
for themselves. The incident could also be the last piece of the idolatry puzzle. That creatures would be envious of their creator has been offered in two ways. The last part of the idolatry puzzle is why humans would still seek some kind of economy with heaven despite their envious stance. Why call on God, let alone the creator? Would that only increase the cause of envy, a constant reminder that they are dependent upon him? Perhaps what we see at Babel is a recognition on the part of humanity that some kind of transcendent perspective on life in a fallen world is needed after all. The prophet Jeremiah links fear of the heavenlies to the origin of Gentile idolatry. I read to you from Jeremiah chapter 10. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by the signs in the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them, for the customs of the people are worthless. Someone cuts down a tree from a forest, it's worked by the hands of a craftsman with a chisel. He directs it with silver and gold, it's fastened with a hammer and nails, so it won't totter. People choose an economy with heaven, with works made by their own hands, because they are envious of the perspective of the true God over them. So this morning, I've attempted to read against the grain of the choosing self's will to power. What we have seen, I think, is the long story of power struggle between those made like the image of the invisible God and his choice to bless them and even save them. Along the way, we've seen sibling rivalry, demonic insurgency and royal apostasy. At the same time, we've noted the sovereign nature of God's choices. Invariably, creaturely rebellion is shown in all its banality and impotence. Those who exercise their will to power against the Lord nevertheless serve his purposes invariably to show grace and mercy. In this context, the choosing self can take its place in a long and ignominious tradition. The heart turned in on itself in a last-ditch effort to avoid the choice of God for his true image-bearer and firstborn. The holiness of God's love naturally means that this inward obsession is the experience of God's wrath. And as Athanasius counseled, we find ourselves back in a situation described by Paul in Romans 1. The wrath of God towards the envy of the man and the woman resulted in their alienation from him and from each other. They are locked in a perpetual struggle over whose version of the likeness of God's image will prevail. Will they be his version of God's image or hers? The viral nature of sin produces an epidemic of uniformity in search of a rival image is to be mounted in the world as their desires are given over to narcissism at the most intimate of levels. The culture of idolatry that their narcissism creates brings all the strife and chaos that Paul describes in the latter part of chapter 1 of Romans. Yet simply pointing to the flaws in the envious only energises their intent. There needs to be a way either to disempower their desire or exhaust it entirely. In Colossians 1.21, Paul writes, Once you are alienated and hostile in your minds in the works of evil, since all things hold together in Jesus, the Messiah of God, we shall return to him tomorrow to find the amazing grace of the firstborn who endures their envy and offers an image worth worshipping. Thank you. Well, friends, I'm sure uh, you are extending all kinds of digital appreciation uh, at the moment. We're sorry we don't have the means to uh, properly receive and acknowledge all of that. Uh, I want to give David a moment to, uh, to catch his breath now and for you to be able to catch up and ask questions. We've got um, a number already of great questions on the Slido app. Please follow the link. You can upvote other people's questions. Uh, and we certainly won't be able to get through all of them, but if you upvote them and bring them to the top of the list, we'll do our best to address those questions. Uh, I wonder if, like me, you were struck this morning by the centrality of envy in the biblical narrative in a way that you may not have been struck before, and the centrality of envy, particularly to a, a biblical understanding of sin. Um, I wonder if, like me, you are also struck by the perversity of envy in a new way, uh, that capacity to turn the goodness of others
into the seedbed of rebellion and hatred even. And worst of all, our envy of the beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, leading us to rebel against God and exalt ourselves. Our envy of our loving Father and of his created uh, and of his goodness of the, as the creator. Earlier generations seem to have seen this more clearly and it makes me just wonder what a child of my times I am. A narcissistic choosing self, perhaps. Well, uh, many more votes have just come in, so let's turn to David and, uh, and get some answers to questions. Firstly, David, the question is, uh, from your definition of envy, what does it mean for some to preach Christ from envy, uh, Philippians 1.15? Hmm. Uh, thank you. That's, that's a great question. Uh, I think as we, as we listen into Paul's reflections on uh, others who preach the gospel, whether it's in Philippians... Oops, we just had a, a glass malfunction. It's all right. No animals were harmed in the making of this film. Where was I? <laughs> oh, you've got to love live TV, don't you? And Paul has many opportunities to comment on uh, the fact that there are others in uh, the first century preaching the gospel. Uh, and uh, if not in Philippians specifically, I think in Corinthians uh, at least, you do get the sense that uh, some who preach Christ do so with the intent of making Paul look bad. Uh, I'm thinking of the super apostles uh, that Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians. Uh, I think that's preaching the gospel out of envy, uh, trying to make uh, Paul, who is the most Christ-like in his miserable state, uh, look miserable uh, and therefore not worthy of trusting his gospel. Uh, that would be my answer. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. Um, another question, and there's a, there's a bunch that, uh, that are around this uh, title. Would you say that envy start, stands at the heart of a biblical portrayal of sin? I guess I think that's what I was getting at. Uh, I know that uh, the tradition usually uh, looks to pride uh, as the, uh, the root of sin, but having, uh, having reconsidered the focal point for sin, which is the cross, what we learn most uh, horribly about sin must start there. And so the journey that we've been on today was from the cross backwards, uh, to reread the story as the gospel prompts us to do. We reread the whole of the uh, Bible from the perspective of the gospel. And so it was from that perspective that I began to see that the envy of the beloved son is actually a long running story of envy of God's choice for him and ultimately envy of God's will over uh, his creatures. Uh, and I think that's important because. Uh, it gets to the root of the hostility that makes for sin. Our therapeutic culture uh, tends to try and relativise uh, the act of sin, that it's uh, a lack of education or somehow an accident uh, from which the choosing self can be removed in terms of its responsibility. But the biblical portrait uh, confirms really Nietzsche's uh, thinking that it's about an active choice against the Father. Uh, I think that's why Jesus tells his disciples that the world hates God uh, and hates him as well, because at the root of sin is envy of God's sovereignty over us. Uh, the trending question on Slido at the moment is, David, were you envious of the glass? Um, I think we'll, uh, we, we'll give you an opportunity to answer that one in a moment, but maybe another question as well. Uh, um, can you say a little bit more about the connection between uh, your definition of envy and uh, the Western tradition and uh, 
particularly with relation to the seven deadly sins and that kind of thing. Well, clearly envy is not the only sin. Uh, I, that's why I have tried to uh, nuance my language in terms of the root uh, of the response of the creature towards the creator uh, and the way that the rest of the story unfolds, we can see that in the incidents of uh, David and Saul, also an element of pride, uh, of covetousness, uh, of fear goes along with that. There's certainly pride in the story of Miriam and Aaron. Uh, there's pride in the brothers who resent uh, Jacob's cho choice of Joseph. So I'm not suggesting that envy is the only sin, more that it's this uh, willful intent against, willful and destructive intent against God and then against each other that produces all kinds of ripples and gives birth to all other kinds of reactions, which we would then consider to be uh, the, other, the other six uh, deadly sins. Oh, and for the record, uh, I'm actually quite sad about that glass. That was a wedding uh, present, uh, and it was the last one of its kind. It survived 30 years this uh, last week. Uh, David, there's a, a whole cluster of questions around uh, the connection between the, the choosing self and envy. Uh, and maybe if I just answer one of the representative ones, um, uh, can the choosing self have a will to power that's driven not by envy, but out of love? Um, it, yeah, and there, there is another question. Uh, is Moses called to choose life, an explicit acknowledgement of the choosing self? If so, what other things might motivate the choosing self? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's important to make a distinction between the intent behind the choice and the act of choosing. Uh, simply making choices between two things, the power to contrary, is not in and of itself evil. Uh, and so uh, making the right choices or what we see in the true son himself, and we'll look at this uh, again tomorrow, the spirit enables the son to will what the father wills. He chooses the glorification of the father out of his pleasure for him and so goes to the cross uh, and that is, as uh, I argued yesterday, born out of his pleasure for the Father. Even in submission, he's expressing his pleasure in the Father. And so the choice of love that is inspired by God's Spirit is a real choice, and it is a constructive choice. It's the choice of giving life rather than taking it away, which is the response of envy. Uh, I think that. Yeah, might have. yeah uh, that's great. Um, uh, we'll just take just a couple more. Um, David, in, in thinking through the implications of this for ministry now, um, and particularly in our, um, in, in our current situation where uh, people are zooming into church, how can we use technology to reach out with the gospel and do church online in a way that doesn't pander to the choosing self? Uh, are there traps to avoid or wisdom that you might have there? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I get where that question is coming from. Uh, what we currently experience is a concentration of all the challenges of being God's people. It's not new to be disinclined to engage bodily with the body. Uh, and now, because we can't have our bodies together, more of our intent not to be embodied together, to be part of the body, is being exposed. Uh, for the last 25 to 30 years, the whole concept of the seeker service has ordered gathering of God's people around the desires, the perceived needs uh, of the choosing self. It's not a new thing by any means. And so in this era where we are, we're really just connecting, we're not gathering, we're only connected to one another, that gives us an opportunity to highlight the fact that we are, in, uh, we are connected 
in sharing in God's spirit that we will come to discover uh, and concentrate on on Thursday when we talk about uh, the chosen church for the, uh, the beloved son. But as we gather together, sorry, as we connect with one another in this digital form, we ought then, I think, to take every opportunity to re-speak, to readdress, to uh, reinterpret the importance of being embodied together, that uh, as we will look at uh, on uh, Thursday, we are constituted in the spirit as the body of Christ. And what we're experiencing now, the, the fracturing of that, is really magnifying a general fracturing that we should feel as we await the final gathering when the new heavens and new earth will result in the resurrection body and all of God's people embodied together everlastingly. Thank you. And last question. I, I know there's a lot of questions uh, that we haven't got to, uh, but the last one and a great note to finish on, I think, is, uh, David, if the choosing self is ultimately motivated by envy of God's choosing of the Son, how do we call on people uh, to ultimately turn to and submit to the Son? Well, you'll have to come back tomorrow and see how he handles envy. Excellent. Uh, what a great segue. And uh, we have been treated very much this morning. Uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, the digital love is coming in. Uh, I don't know that, of, of course, but uh, I assume that's happening. Um, and your appreciation for David and his work. Uh, I am very much looking forward to uh, the next three lectures that we have still to go and to come back tomorrow to hear the answer to that question. Uh, can I remind you that we will begin again at nine o'clock uh, tomorrow morning, same uh, channel. And if you are a student, then you'll begin again at 11.15 uh, for your next class today. Before we go our different ways now, again, can I say thank you, David, and let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you we thank you that in your goodness, you have chosen your son. And Lord, we recognise in our perversity that we reject your choice and want to exalt ourselves. And we pray, Father, that you might have mercy to forgive us for that. And we pray, Father, that by your spirit, you would so rewire us that we long to glorify your son and not to replace him. Father, we pray that we would not be jealous of your position, but that in fact we would willingly submit to you and joyfully serve you with every breath we take. And we pray it for our own good, but for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tomorrow.